What song was that from? I'll wait. Bet you can't guess. That's from a Nickelback song called Bottoms Up. Yes, welcome to maybe my finest edition of the Legendary Licks series. Licks that will never be legendary because they're from lame songs. And unfortunately, Nickelback, despite their awesome sounding music, tend to write just the worst lyrics. And this is coming from a guy who's heard modern pop country lyrics. I wanna say before we get too deep into this video that I actually like all the songs in this video uh, in one way or another, and I think that they're pretty good songs overall. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings if you have a soft spot for any of these tunes, but at the same time, I think it's fair to say that a lot of these songs or bands are polarizing, to put it lightly, and as a result, a lot of great guitar moments are lost because these songs are perhaps written off as pieces of crap and uh, thus you will never hear the guitar parts until now. I will shine light on some of the finest pieces of guitar work that you probably didn't realize happened in these kind of lame songs that I kind of like. Now we're not gonna get too far into like music theory or anything like that, so I'm gonna basically break down these licks and show you what's great about them and how you can apply these concepts to your own guitar playing. But I will say there are some pretty technique heavy driven parts in some of these as you heard in that opening solo. So if you do wanna get deep into sweet picking, legato and tapping and harmonics and really all the technique side of things, there's an entire techniques curriculum in Guitar Super system, which is linked right down below. So many thousands of students have enrolled in the past few months, and I am actually amazed by how many of you have given me such great feedback and really seem to be liking the new platform. So thanks a lot for all of your support. Now let's get to licks that will never be legendary because they're from lame songs. Starting with this Nickelback thing, and basically the lick that I want to break down for you is that opening lick, because it's extremely difficult, and it's straight out of the D minor pentatonic scale with this added flat five, so. That is what I would learn first, is just 10 to 13 on the G, B, and E strings. Get acquainted with that position, and the lick itself goes something like this. We'll keep it slow first. And as you can hear, I have a ton of gain and a ton of delay and reverb. I haven't even added the wah pedal yet, but that is really kind of necessary to get this lick up to speed and make it sound as epic as it does in the Nickelback recording. I never thought I would be playing a Nickelback song on my channel, but here we are. So basically, the motion in your right hand is what's important here because the left hand, you're probably pretty used to this kind of pentatonic driven movement. <laughs> So you'll notice this string skipping motion. We're hitting a down stroke on the G string, coming back an up stroke on the E string. And you could potentially do a down stroke on the G and E strings uh, to make this happen. But I find that if you get this movement happening as opposed to this one, it sets you up a little bit uh, better ergonomically speaking, so. So that's the motion and really everything that happens after that is just sort of a jumbled mess of wah. Not really worth showing you. It's kind of pentatonic driven, a little bit of natural minor and maybe harmonic. I, I honestly couldn't tell um, a lot of what was happening after that initial lick, but that lick is so cool. It's definitely worth stealing. And really the way to get it quick is just to practice that motion and start slowly with a metronome and speed it up. And of course, add in a wah pedal.
moving on to another lick that will never be legendary, unfortunately, because it's from a lame song. So this next song is, well, it, it's probably the reason most people have a problem with this particular artist, that artist being John Mayer. This is called Your Body is a Wonderland. I don't really have anything against this song. I think it actually has some cool guitar parts, but I've actually seen John Mayer in concert and when he's about to play this song, he actually addressed the audience and he was like, all right guys, just hold on. We're gonna get through these next three or four minutes and then we're gonna get back to the show. He says something along those lines. So he understands that while this song obviously was very meaningful for his career when he started out, it's not necessarily his favorite song and we'll just leave it at that. But there is a part at the end of this song, it's the bridge, and it's this little instrumental, very jazzy section that I think nobody really remembers. They just think of this song and they're like, oh, bubblegum tongue, screw this guy. I'll show you the part in its entirety and then we'll break down what's happening. I am in drop D. <laughs> Nifty, right? Did you know that happened at the end of that song? Did you ever make it through that song? Well, here we go. I'm going to show you these little dyad shapes. And if you don't know what a dyad is, again, it's a little bit of music theory. You can check out Guitar Super System for the full gamut of music theory awesomeness. But a dyad is essentially a two note chord. So we have first starting with the D to establish the mood. We have this. little passage. So if we wanted to analyze this, we have a G and an E. In the context of D, that's actually very interesting because it's actually an 11 and a 9 over D. So it's very interesting, those extensions. And then it comes down to this little major sound. But again, with that D ringing, it loses its kind of major tonality and becomes this sort of open-ended sound. Could go either way. And then we come over here to the 10th fret, 8th fret, and then 7th and 6th fret, all on the D and B strings, respectively. So all together. Really nifty. And then... We had this little slide happening, so we keep this shape. So this little half triangle shape from seven to nine, keeping this six to eight on the B string. And then back to this original 10th fret on the D and B strings, sliding down a whole step. And then we're gonna get a little interesting here. We start off the same, but now, we're gonna move this exact position up a string set. So we have the 10th fret of the G and E strings, and then the 12th fret of the D and B strings. Very ominous there. I love that change in this bridge. So we go. And then the kind of turnaround thing, I just go. Really uh, just kind of old timey feeling, you know? Uh, it's really out of place in this song, honestly. But uh, I think it was just a testament to maybe John Mayer wanting to have some sort of interesting musical part, maybe as just like an Easter egg for people who got that far through an otherwise kind of bubblegum pop song. Anyways, the second part here goes. And that little slide, that little delicate detail there is really nice. Same thing there. And then the ending is... So with that one we have... Same thing, same thing, same thing. But then we come up here to 14 and 15 on the G and E strings. And then 12th fret, G and E strings. So the two resolutions I think are really cool are 
and then we go. Overall, a really interesting part. So I'm using my thumb and middle finger to work these string sets so you can see from this perspective. Moving on to another lick that will never be legendary because it's in a lame song. And now we come to a song that really brings out a different animal in certain people, especially when those certain people have been drinking alcoholic beverages and just really want to let loose and belt. Yes, that's right. We're talking about a song by the Backstreet Boys. The Backstreet Boys were the first boy band that I was ever exposed to and as a result, I kind of wrote them off because, you know, it wasn't cool to like the Backstreet Boys when you were younger. But that doesn't mean we can't appreciate now this amazing guitar solo in the song Larger Than Life. Again, have you ever gotten through that song or been listening hard enough and not dancing or singing your guts out to actually hear that guitar part? And I actually do think some guitar players are aware of that little guitar solo. It's like, oh yeah, the larger than life guitar solo. But let's break down exactly what's going on here because there are a lot of cool things that I think are worth getting into. So we kick things off with a traditional kind of bluesy phrase. <laughs> And the solo really starts to shine when we get to this next part. Now, you can take this in kind of two different parts. First, the bend. I love this double bend situation where it's not an attack on the second bend. It's just a... That is really cool and definitely something worth involving in your own guitar playing. And then, of course, this kind of pentatonic... Thing. It doesn't matter if you're that accurate with the notes, as long as you end on... In time, you're gonna sound awesome. So, we're right out of the C minor pentatonic scale. What I think is cool about this solo is the use of bends, because we have some really expressive notes that they're hitting here. is so awesome because it's really sort of establishing a motif and then delaying that motif with the third kind of little passage there. So we have, that's a one and a half step bend. That's the first kind of little motif repeating itself, but then it goes. So it's like delaying that melodic rhythm and really hitting that root note there is just kind of bringing the listener back home. And I think that's really, really smart and effective guitar playing right there. And then finally, the capper phrase is kind of like a blend between Eric Johnson and Angus Young or something like that, where we have this blistering six tuplet pentatonic run. And it has uh, two hits on that last C note just to kind of finish off that rhythm. And overall, it's one of the most badass guitar solos of the 90s as a whole. Who would have thought it would come in a Backstreet Boys song? Unfortunately, that may never be legendary because it was in a Backstreet Boys song, but hey, if this video works, maybe it will become legendary. Who knows? Anyways, on to the next lick. So again, we come to yet another song that I am actually a fan of, and I'm absolutely a fan of the guitar player, but again, this is a song that 
is not really known for its guitar part. It's more known for the singer who people like to make fun of, I guess. But in all seriousness, this is one of the coolest riffs of this band's entire discography. That band is Creed. The song is called Higher. So, a lot going on here that is sort of happening under the radar. If you're listening to this riff, you don't necessarily hear the intricacies, you just hear the big wall of sound, which I think is a testament to why this song and Creed in general were so popular, is because these riffs were, on the surface, pretty basic sounding, I think, but there's really a lot to dive into. For example, this little movement on the D power chord, so. That little motion, the skeleton of this riff and maybe a lesser guitar riff that others may have come up with for a song like this would be something like. But as you can see here, Mark Tremonti really does a lot with a little bit of harmony. That is essentially replacing. And then we have. And I can't actually hear if he's playing this uh, upper fourth. Either way, the point is we have this power chord and obviously I'm in drop D here. We have the power chord on the fifth fret. Then we push that finger down to the fourth fret and maintain the pinky on the seventh fret of the D. And then we do this little slide to have that little motion happening. And then five, four, open. And then we do the same thing. And then we have this little lick. <laughs> that is so cool. That doesn't happen in top Billboard songs these days, which is sad, but at least it happened when Mark Tremonti was top in the charts. So we have this little thing starting on the sixth fret of the G string. And we just have seventh fret, ninth. Pretty simple, but again, in the context of this riff. Uh, on the second pass through, just a nice little sultry bend on the fourth fret of the D string. Open it, uh, open it, open string, pull off there. And you notice how these little licks blend with the riff. It's sort of like a metal version of Jimi Hendrix, how these licks and riffs are blending together. Never be afraid to add a little pinch harmonic there. It's always nice. So, moving on to the final lick that will never be legendary because it's in a lame song. And uh, there might be some question whether or not this song is lame. I think it's actually kind of lame, but in the most fun way possible. Here we are. The final lick. I actually had to do a little research when I was trying to come up with licks and riffs for this video. I was like, all right, what's a lame song that has great guitar parts in it? And it was hard to come up with this list. I don't know if you're gonna think this is a lame song. I just think it's sort of overplayed, but it's also probably the most recognizable riff on this list. And yet, I would definitely bet that this is the last guitar part that you would recognize from the song. 
Let me see if you can identify this. Tell me if this sounds familiar. <laughs> That's right, My Sharona, by a band called The Knack. Maybe a one-hit wonder, I don't really know any other songs by them. But that riff is not the riff that I think is legendary. It's this little like pre-chorus or bridge or something section that happens in the middle of the song. It happens a couple times, but I'm gonna play the first time it happens. And there's just this nasty, raunchy guitar stuff alongside this very beautiful chordal work. And I, I don't know, just, it's great. You gotta hear it. This is what it sounds like. What do you think? Did you know that part was in that song? <laughs> I definitely didn't. There's this a really cool pull-off thing that I want to show you here. That's really nice. It's just not really, again, it's sort of out of place in that song. And the chords that are happening are also really cool. I actually played two different guitar parts to make this backing track and the first part is going like this. Really cool sounding. And then this other part is going. So with all that happening alongside this just nasty over that staple lick, uh, there's just so many cool little guitar intricacies in the song, and yet all you really ever remember is M -m -m my Sharona and some creepy dude with a bowl cut dancing around weirdly. Um, so take that for what it's worth. I think it's a great song. I think all these songs are great, honestly. And I mean, if they have great guitar parts in them, maybe that just makes them great on their own, but I think they're underappreciated due to the surface level uh, understanding of the tunes themselves. So hopefully this video shed a little light on these great guitar parts and gave you a little inspiration in the process. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate all of your support, all of you who have been joining Guitar Super System. I've really enjoyed it. And I can't wait to keep growing this platform with you guys. So until next time. Oh, no, no, no. That's, that was bad. Until next time. Oh, keep shredding.